so much of how we think has been has been influenced by how the world is presented to us and then build your life based on that truth until we woke up into this American nightmare. Yeah. It, is, it is an indictment to, to American corporations saying that they have lost touch, they have lost control, whether it's Fox News or MSNBC or CNN or whatever, they're all doing it from a particular perspective, serving power. Any cursory view of history shows that the threat between Europe and Russia always comes from Europe. Who is the aggressor in Ukraine? If you want to talk about banana republic, the fix is in a naked deployed republic site. There it is that says, let's make 1984 fiction again. Kevin Howard, welcome to the Book Thinkers Life Changing Books Podcast Round Two. How are you feeling today? I am feeling great. So good to see you, Nick, and you, Luke. You know, I enjoyed our conversation so much. You had to have another. It was like a lace potato chip. You are speaking <laughs> my language. Yeah, you can't just have one. And in fact, maybe we will have many more. We'll see. So for those that didn't have a chance to listen or watch the first episode, obviously we encourage them to go back and check that out, but I'd like to have you set the stage, sort of reintroduce yourself for everybody, clean slate, pretend they don't know you. Who is Kevin Howard and why did he write this book Onward at Last? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Nick. Yeah, uh, so yes, my name is Kevin Howard and I am I am your prototypical American, born and raised in the United States, built a career in banking, you know, you know, thought I had built the perfect, idyllic, middle-class American life, and then had this crisis moment where I was like, okay, I'm here, I'm in the house, I got the toys, I got the wife, I got the kids, and I felt empty. It felt like it didn't, what, what did I do this for? And, and, and it sent me down a 10-year path of rediscovering who I am. And I, I realized that that I had built that whole thing largely based on social expectations, based on the virtues that define our lives as Americans. And so I wrote Onward at Last based on the, what I learned when I rediscovered myself, what, what I learned in that process. And, and I wanted to, to write a clarion call to other, to other Americans, because basically for the most part, it does seem most people I've ever met, regardless of age, you know, just no matter, and regardless of their level of success, they just don't feel the fulfillment that you would think is commensurate with 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 the privilege that we have as Americans. You know, relative to the rest of the world, and so this this is a onward at last is a clarion call to to reconsider these virtues that define our lives because that's where I found my problem was: freedom, independence, self interest, and competition, and and there's nothing inherently wrong with these virtues, but something has been going on over the last 50 years that have pushed these virtues to an extreme that no longer serve us. And, and so for the context of this conversation, I'd like to use an analogy, the RPMs in your car. So you're driving down the street and, and as, you, as you accelerate through your gears, your RPMs might bounce between 3,000 and 4,000 RPMs, which are deep in the black. The car is functioning the way it's supposed to. But way at the top of the register, around 7,000, 8,000 is where you see the red zone. And what has happened in America, particularly to these four primary American virtues, is our economics has tightened, which has affected our politics, which has affected our social discourse, you know, and, and, and created the polarization we experience today. And each one of these purposeful events have pushed the RPMs deeper and deeper up the red register until they are secure deep in the, in the red. And that's where we are today. Nothing is functioning the way it was intended. American democracy is not functioning the way it's intended. American economics is not functioning the way it's intended. And, and, as was, and, and, and so how do you unwind that? That's what today's conversation is about. Oof. I've got goosebumps ready to go. How do you <laughs> unwind that? I mean, it's such a big question and you're totally right. I, Luke and I, I think we're also representations of the average American and the average American sits somewhere in the middle compared to what we see on news. Like there's this political division between the extreme right and the extreme left and everybody's yelling at each other and it just seems to get worse and worse and more separate and divided and polarized. 
And the vast majority of people sit somewhere in the middle, closer to the center of the aisle. And they look both ways, left, right, and they go, what is happening in this country? And so, yeah, what's step number one? What do we start the conversation with? Well, we need to we need to look at what how we got here in order to figure out where we need to go. So so bear with me a little bit of a history lesson, but not but an interactive history lesson, because this really just started. It started about 50 years ago. So so leading it. So 50 years ago, well, let's say 1970. Right. So what's happening in 1970? OK, we are 20 years, 25 years after World War Two. We're at, you know, the New Deal was established in the 30s in response to the Great Depression, you know, massive unemployment, massive wealth and income inequality. OK, so Roosevelt comes in and establishes a huge safety uh, safety net, you know, puts, you know, millions of Americans back to work building American infrastructure or whatever. It leads us into World War Two. We 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 act, which activates you know American productivity for the war movement or whatever. We fight the war. We come home. We you know Truman and Eisenhower extend the the New Deal into home expanded home ownership, expanded access to a, a university level education, right? And and what it does it produces from 1950 to 1970 is a period where the American middle class and the American working class expanded up the socioeconomic class, you know, to where they could actually access the American dream. You know, in 1970, the typical working class, non-college educated working class person was, was, you know, Hollywood always has a way of showing the expression. Archie Bunker was that person, right? I mean, so here was, here was the American working class age between 40 and 50, you know, 40 and 55, you know, union, you know, but he can afford to own his own house and send his daughter Gloria to college, you know, and, you know, for on his salary. Right. OK, so this was this was where the American working class was and where where the middle class, the, the, the middle class had grown to the biggest in, in modern history and across the country. And uh, the, the, the average CEO pay was about 30 times the average workers pay. OK. But we had, but there was a price to be paid. There was an expression to be paid because what, but by 1970, because the 60s were turbulent for a reason. So what had this empowered working class done? This empowered um, middle class done? They, they established, they established the civil rights movement. They established the equal rights movement. They established the anti-war movement. They populated a media that was in the in the process of bringing down a sitting president, right? You know, so you know, so so what 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 that shared prosperity had done was empowered people to ch- to speak truth to power, and un- the universities were a hotbed for critical thinking and challenging the establishment, right? Music was vivid and vibrant and 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 transcendent, quite frankly. Okay, then comes 1971. And, and and a gentleman named and a gentleman named Lewis Powell, who was a very famous lawyer at the time, writes a document called the Powell Memorandum, and he writes it to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in 1971, and it is it is an indictment to to American corporations, saying that they have lost touch, they have lost control. Of, of American po- economics and society, you know, and that in order for them to regain control, they need to invest more money than had ever invested to influence the media, the university system, and our government, both the political branch and the legal, right, to the interests of the American corporation. So he 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 wrote this letter to the Chamber of Commerce, very extensive, very scholarly. You know, doesn't sound like it's inciting anything, right? But but it's 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 it it, it laid out the roadmap. And then in 1972, Richard Nixon appoints him to the U.S. Supreme Court, where he becomes very quietly one of the most pro corporate jurists on that court, right? Okay, all right. So he goes on and. The, the chamber and, and, and business leaders start executing the plan. 
And, and the proof of the pudding as to how they how completely they executed that plan is if you look at if you look at what has happened since 1970, the early 70s, to each one of those institutions. You know, in terms of media, right? The the news media, Walter Cronkite and all that, literally the way it was organized then through the 60s and the 50s, all the way back to the 40s, was these were these the news divisions were not self self sufficient. They were supported. They were public service, supported by the entertainment divisions, right? Okay. And so, since it, it, starting in the 1980s with the creation of CNN and other other you know media and stuff like that, wealth, American corporations, flooded the zone, and converted a system of media that was for profit. So for profit media, right? Which, which shifted basically by paying these, th these talking heads, by paying these broadcasters, making them millionaires, right? It co-opted their ability to be independent, right? And all of a sudden they start telling the news based on who was writing those checks, right? And, 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 and you see progressively what we have. We have the creation in the 90s of, okay, uh, we have uh, Fox doing the conservative media. We have, you know, pick a choice, CNN, you know, MSNBC doing the liberal media, and we have now the echo chamber from a media perspective has been created. Okay, All right, but but how did it happen? Money flooding the zone. Okay, look at the university system. Okay, progressively, these university systems have been starved of their tax base by the states. And in their place, American corporations have invested more money than they've ever spent. And how? by encouraging the best and the brightest of the professors to do research and development, to do, you know, for, you know, for the benefit of, multi, of these multinational corporations, taking them out of the classroom where they, were, where they were shaping creative minds, where they were teaching and encouraging students to think and, and challenge. Okay, the best and the brightest, where they were gonna make their money was on the research side, was on the publishing side, okay. Fast forward to how, how did we develop, how did the pharmaceutical industry develop the, the vaccines for COVID, right? Publicly sourced university research, RM, the mRNA technology, we paid for it, right? But somehow, somehow um, uh, pharmaceutical companies had proprietary rights to it so that they could profit from it exclusively. Okay, yeah, this is, this is how the, the university systems got co-opted by flooding billions of dollars into the system, taking the source of their money from the from from taxation, laying the burden on tuition on the students, which ran up student debt and everything else, robbing the students of the best and the brightest teachers because they were getting all this money over here to produce, you know, to do research and development on behalf of these corporations. Okay, so that's the university system, right? I mean, government, I mean, while, while if from a legal standpoint, Roe v. Wade seemed to define the focus of the, 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 the demarcation between left and right arguments, but that's the cover story. What was really going on for most of those years, right, is the emergence of the corporation as a human. At the, 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 nothing got expanded persistently in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, but the rights of the American corporation. And now as a matter of law, they're a superhuman because unlike you and I, who, who whose individual contributions, I think are capped at $2,500, you know, into, in, to any particular campaign, these you know, corporations can, can put as much money as they want into any campaign and they do. They absolutely do. Once again, they flooded the zone of politics and they own our politicians, right? They, they literally, they've raised the stakes in terms of what it costs to run for election that the politicians have to go to them for the money. And they do. And, and, and now the courts have given them the right to give as much money as they want. It's just legal bribery. Okay. So this is, so the, through the courts and through the uh, funding of campaigns, the government is now owned. You got a recent Harvard University study that says the American electorate has no influence on public policy, none. I mean, 80% of the country supports raising the minimum, federal minimum wage, dead on arrival. You know, 70% of NRA people support 
you know, re, you know, reasonable background checks, closing the gun show loophole, dead on arrival, right? So the American public has no, okay. So that's how the government got co-opted. And, and so my basic point is when this document, the, the Powell memo, started us down a path where wealth basically said, the cost of shared prosperity is too high because we lost control of the American people. So we, we got to fix this by breaking the back of shared prosperity. But our predecessors learned a wicked lesson, which is gilded age, roaring 20s. You consolidate too much money in few hands. You create these great depressions and wealth gets crushed along the way. All those people jumping out of the window and <laughs> for the stock market crash, right? Okay, so how can we, how, they, they said about, we need to do this. We can't have broad-based prosperity, but how can we prevent us from getting crushed with, with the necessary depression that comes from it? And they devised this strategy, you know, you know, privatize profits, publish, you know, socialize losses, right? And they set about through the, through the Federal Reserve and through the politicians they owned, to curate an economics that as we go into a business cycle decline, right, they're protected and the rest of us get crushed, right? And um, the, 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 the practice session was Alan Greenspan in 1996, who exercised the first soft landing in US history. And what that is, is so we had then, we had like a $14 trillion economy. And when, when you, you're that big and you start declining, you, it, historically, it goes from positive growth into negative growth because you can't turn the momentum of that massive ship without it going negative before then it turns, it hits rock bottom and turns back up. Well, Alan Greenspan did figure out in 1996 how to use, with, with very aggressive federal uh, monetary policy, how to turn that ship before it went negative, which gave Bill Clinton his you know, double you know, a period of economic growth. Okay, but the problem is that didn't solve that 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 protected it while well, that would protect wealth from getting hurt. It also didn't hurt the average person, the average person. So, you know, it didn't achieve the idea of breaking the back of shared prosperity. So that wasn't going to be the solution. They found the solution in 2008. This is where we, we demonstrate what privatizing profits and socializing losses is, you know, is is TARP and unpacking the Federal Reserve to cover Wall Street's losses, right? While millions of Americans get devastated. So th that's just the top layer. I just wanted to show you the demarcation point was the Powell Memorandum, and then, then wealth set about to co-opt the media, the university system, and our government in order to consolidate wealth to themselves break the back of, 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 of broad prosperity so people can't hold them to account, right? And 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 create the toxicity we have today. Whew. <laughs> you said just top layer and I'm over here, I'm, I'm chuckling a little bit because I'm like, holy smokes, this is just the top layer. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, I try to, I didn't want to talk 20 minutes, you know, so no, that's the oh, top it's, layer because I want you to awesome. penetrate it, challenge yeah. it. It, it. It is, I can, I can tell you, as I realized this, I mean, I had 10 years where I was deeply depressed, angry, like all the all the things you go through, like right. with a death, where you're bitter, you're angry, you you want to you want to go attack the, the 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 you know you want to be one of the January six. I mean, you know, you go through these frustrations because it's causing a magnitude of pain, right? And and these people and, and these people are just counting coins and stacking. Well, 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 more and more people. A you know, you know, one nostril, then both nostrils are underneath the water, you know. So, so I mean, I, you know, but I want to stop because I want you guys to dive in there with some questions and then we can kind of penetrate, you know, for, for our listeners. Yeah. Well, I, I want to back up just a little bit because I'm, I'm curious. Number one, how did you get so interested in all of, all of these things? Because you're obviously, you've delved deep into all these topics and you've delved into the history of it and everything. So, just backing up a little bit, how did you yourself? get into this yeah well interesting i always i wanted to be a banker you know and so when i went to college i didn't want to be your run of the mill banker i didn't want to get a finance degree and then go get my mba to me that was the beaten path i wanted a different lens to analyze risk 
And, and, and so I got a bachelor of science degree in economics and I, I went and got my law degree. And, and, and so I have used applied economics and the law to, exi to, to examine credit risk, to examine investment risk as I've been a banker. And my primary focus was to help young entrepreneurs grow their businesses to customize the kind of financial services they needed in order to make their dreams come true, right? And that was my passion and I and I loved it. So through that lens is when I started the law, which is the politics, which is the courts and the economics is where I started seeing why is it, you know, and this career was occurring during the 90s into the 2000s. And it used to be so much easier for a person to save up a little money and start a business, right? And then and then, and then, and then, and then build something, right? And I watched progressively over 20 years how that became nearly impossible. And you know, you know, and, and it's why it's because progressively leaders were tightening the screws on who gets who gets paid for what they do. Right, right, and therefore, if, and if and if you can't build savings, you can't start a business, which is why new business formation has collapsed in America relative to where it had been, you know. And um, so, so that's how I got interested in. It. I, I noticed it while I was trying to help these entrepreneurs and customize financial services down through the years, and 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 then it became a source for well, why am I so disillusioned? You know, you know, as as I thought I had achieved my American dream. And, uh, you know, so it gave me the information I need. It can feel so hopeless. I was going to say hopeless, hopeless <laughs> for uh, people listening today. And I'm wondering, do you do you have any I don't know. What's the what's the positive? What's the positive outlook? Is there any positive outlook or oh, are we all total, just are we all just you, screwed? <laughs> no, no, there is total positive outlook. Luke. Uh, here's, here's the joy. It's still a, it's still a democracy. Do you know why? Do you, do you know why it costs so much to run for election? It is because each of us have been convinced that our vote doesn't matter. Do putting some effort into figuring it out doesn't matter because you know, you know you know. So therefore, therefore, in order for us to even know who's running, they have to spoon feed. They have to pay for advertising and this and that. We're all this is as sophisticated as your generation is on the internet. It seriously, less than an hour in any election, you could find out everyone who's running, what they did, what's their background, what they stand. No one has to spend a dollar to get you that information, right? It's because people have been convinced not to spend that hour that they don't do it and therefore elect people who actually serve them, right? Okay. So so the 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 answer is yes, we can reclaim our sovereignty. We can take we could take back our democracy. We can have the government actually serve the people by remembering that we are so much more than what society has convinced us we are. We are we, we are so much more. We are so much more powerful, you know. It, it, you know, and that in fact, once we remember who we are, that we are individual members of one interdependent human family, once we remember that power. All of a sudden, my gosh, man, we can then decide, okay, all right, I'm not going to listen to their prevailing narrative. I'm not going to listen to the stories that have been convincing me through manufactured consent, right? To, oh, the, the problem is those people over there and the problem is, is Putin. Is, oh, no, no, that's all the, the, the story to distract us from where all the money is going, <laughs> right? right? If you start saying, I am capable of actually, I'm not going to listen to that, and I'm going to see what can I find out is actually true, right? Spend the hour on the internet, right? All of a sudden, you're empowering yourself with the information to hold power accountable, right? And, and as soon as a critical mass of us simply do that, right, all of a sudden, they have to listen. They have to take note, or they're just going to get run out, <laughs> right? And, and so, yeah, the, the good news is, is the secret sauce is simply us remembering who we are. We made this country. <laughs> we, we we still send them to office, right? To, to you know, they serve us. And until we recognize that we do not rely on them for who we are, that we can actually assess what is true or not true and build our lives on that basis, 
oh, that, you know, then once again, then we will be running things. And so this is what this book is all about, to get people to silence the white noise of manufactured consent, reject the prevailing narrative. So let's talk about a few prevailing narratives. I mean, I have a commentary call. Well, called, Kevin, can, um, I, can I stop oh, yes. you for just a quick minute? So of course, a couple of I'm comments. So, yeah. No, no, no. I just you you have I was running. <laughs> so many so many interesting subjects. I want to make a couple of comments. Number one, uh, I don't think I mentioned this on our last episode. Maybe I did, but stop me if I did. I I visited Rome last year, and we got a Wonderful. tour of the Colosseum. And one of the things that our guide told us was the Colosseum was originally constructed by the Roman elites as a distraction. There were there were entertainment shows every single day of the week and it was free admission so that poor people and slaves could attend these shows and get wrapped up in the entertainment to forget that everybody who actually matters is over here. Like you said, yeah. just stacking coins all day long. Right. So that's what these uh, political sort of like these things that get thrown in our face all day on the news that are literally manufactured to generate animosity and get us angry and yell at each other. It's all a distraction. So I wanted to mention that. I also, before we move on, I wanted to get your thoughts on, if you saw it, Robert Kennedy Jr.'s speech the other day, because he talked about like breaking that bond between corporate America and the government. Yes. So I thought that was pretty cool. Oh no, he's he's amazing, and once again, he's he's talking about he specifically talks about breaking the prevailing narrative, how, how, showing how much of a lie and how much of a manipulation. Every, I mean, I, I saw an interview with him recently, similar to the speech where he was talk. It goes all the way back to okay, how we've made Iran an enemy. <laughs> right, how we overthrew their democratically elected government in the 50s and installed the government that led to the Shah so we could get cheap oil in the United States. And 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 why, and why that ultimately led when the Shah was going to die of dying of cancer in the 70s and he needed um, protection. We, we, we arranged for his protection to leave the country and why the first thing that we can the country did was attack the U.S. embassy. No one gave us, gave us the explanation, but we make these enemies. And, and so, no, Robert Kennedy Jr., he is huge. And I'm I, I I'm fully supportive of him only because again he's speaking empowerment and he's speaking truth you know to power and and they don't like it. <laughs> <They don't> like <laughs> it. You're not wrong. They don't like it. All right. Sorry, I had to jump in there and and add the Coliseum comment, and I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, RKJ over there. But yeah, back back to what uh what did you want to bring up next? Well, yeah, I I just so the process of discovering who we are is 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 to break away i mean so much of how we think has been has been influenced by how the world is presented to us how how the the, the labels that are given to us you know who who has been scapegoated right as soon as the average person recognizes that okay this this person who has been totally vilified right is that it's not actually true, right? They will do that just like any lot. All of a sudden they will start asking questions. They will start believing that, okay, even from their trusted source, because that's the thing, whether it's Fox News or MSNBC or CNN or whatever, they're all doing it from a particular perspective serving power, right? Okay, so let's take the, mo the current most vilified person, like Putin, <laughs> how about Putin? Okay, all right, so, the prevailing narrative is that uh, 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 an aggressive and, you know, the, the new Hitler has arrived in, in Russia and he has engaged in a naked attack, unprovoked attack against the Ukraine and that everyone needs to rush to Ukraine's support and help. Okay. So what is, okay. And, and so that's, and, and, and so we, we gave Russia the, the economic death penalty. We seized their their U.S. dollars everywhere. <laughs> we banned trade with them universally, right? We cut off their central bank from the international trading system, right? Th th this has never been happened to a country that's in the G20. No, never happened to any country in the world. Okay, and we did this because of this naked aggression against Ukraine. 
But what is the story behind what's going on between Ukraine and Russia? Okay. Well, we could, you know, just we, all we have to do is start going backwards a little bit. Okay. All right. So the, the Ukraine was given their independence by the former Soviet Union in the, in the early 90s, right? And Gorbachev was negotiating with George H.W. Bush, first Ronald Reagan, but then George H.W. Bush. And, and, and basically, the idea was this. The Soviet Union was agreeing to d- dismantle their empire. And their hope was that we would integrate them the way we did to Germany and Japan after World War II, right? So they, so, so they said, we will dismantle, allow to be independent, all the satellite states that we control. We will bring the, the nukes back to Russia safely so that they would not get in the hands of any terrorists or whatever. They went as far as saying they will support the reunification of Germany and support a reunified Germany joining NATO. The condition is that NATO would agree never to never to expand east of Germany. There were 13, 14 Warsaw Pact nations that were a security buffer between Europe and Russia. Now, any cursory view of history shows that the threat between Europe and Russia always comes from Europe. It's not from Russia to Europe. So you can look at who, how many deaths were in the Napoleonic Wars, how many deaths were in World War I, how many deaths were in World War II. I mean, rightfully, we speak of the 8 million Jews. Rightfully, horrible, heinous, unthinkable. But 20, up to 27 million Russians died in, in, in World War II. Okay. So the, the former Soviet Union had a security buffer, very much like the United States has the Monroe Doctrine. The entire Western Hemisphere is the security buffer of the United States, which is why we escalated in the Cuban Missile Crisis, because the Soviet Union was violating our security buffer by putting into intercontinental ballistic missiles in Cuba. So here, here, the Soviet Union said, we're going to dismantle, and we're asking you to respect that security buffer. All of them will be independent. All those countries, including the Ukraine, a condition of their independence was that they would not join NATO. They would be neutral, like Switzerland, okay? All right. So this was happening. And since that agreement, that was was a private assurance. And by the way, private assurances is how the Soviet Union and and the United States dealt with each other to solve the Cuban Missile Crisis. So these are serious things that leaders do. Right. Okay. So so after that private assurance, we accelerated the expansion of NATO East. I mean, we we have uh, Poland is in NATO. And Poland has intercontinental ballistic missiles <laughs> on the border of Russia. <laughs> okay, but what, what really broke the back of Russia, and they complained bitterly as we entered all these countries in at the United Nations. Okay, is when we overthrew, when we, sur- sur- you know, always black ops overthrew a pro, um, a pro-Russian Ukrainian government, and installed a, an anti-Russian government in Ukraine in 2013, who then turned around and killed tens of thousands of Russian Russian Ukrainians, right? And changed the Ukrainian constitution that allowed them to join NATO. And then by the time Zelensky got elected, right, they actually start talking about joining NATO, which is when he pushed the troops to the border of, of, of the Ukraine. So the question actually based on history is, who is the aggressor in Ukraine? I mean, what is NATO's interest, <laughs> you know, in moving, in destroying the security buffer for the for Russia, other than to instigate, you know, of, uh, what what are they supposed to do? What would we do? <laughs> what did we do? Right? I mean, all you have to do is ask yourself: If Canada signs a nuclear security treaty with China, and China endeavors to put nuclear weapons in Canada. We are all going to find out how sovereign Canada is, <laughs> right? Okay, <Fast>. so <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, so this is the story. This is the truth about what's happening in Ukraine. And guess what? The rest of the world knows it. The global Brazil is making a laughing stock. They will fuse the buy into the narrative and are negotiating for peace, right? I mean, <laughs> the Russians and Ukrainians would have had a peace deal if the United States didn't get the British Prime Minister to go there and squash it. 
the idea is so this is this is an example of how the prevailing narrative is not true is designed to invoke hatred and take our attention, suck the oxygen out of the room to push it in one direction or another. And it's been going on for, I mean, progressively. I mean, so in my in my commentary, um, in my commentary and open letter regarding the war in Ukraine, I just lay out everyone from, you know, Os Osama bin Laden, you know, and our relationship with him and the Mujahideen back in the 1980s <laughs> we trained the Mujahideen to defeat the Russians in Afghanistan you know and on and on I mean all these people whether it's Noriega in Panama you know they were working for us <laughs> you know you know you know you know and so that's all these people we've been convinced to hate it's a part of the manufactured consent and I and I lay these things out as a former veteran former FEMA disaster assistance law, uh, officer loving our country to empower our fellow Americans to say, stop listening to this nonsense. Stop being defined by this. Challenge it, find out what's true, right? And then build your life on that basis, right? You know, and, and so I will stop there. But <laughs> so yes, that's my first effort. Let's let's dispel the prevailing narrative. Was 1984 actually fiction? That's the question. So I'll oh, kick no. it over to Luke. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I almost wore a shirt. I got a I got a shirt that says, let's make 1984 fiction again. I'm oh, you, I love you know, it. <laughs> but I said, you know, you know, we don't have to throw the bombs out there yet. <laughs> you talk about this, um, this concept, manufactured consent. And I think like you've dispelled it pretty well, but do you think you could maybe try to describe it to our listeners in a few, like in a few words, in a couple sentences, what exactly that is and how it affects their daily lives? Well, first and foremost, no idea is original, but that con that that term is Noam Chomsky, and um, I, I forgot the other writer who wrote a, a legendary book on that subject, right? And, and Chomsky is amazing, right? So, but again, you know, it, it what what the principle, the idea is, is to create a narrative that frames frames what you think is happening in such a way. To, in, to induce you to make choices in alignment with that narrative, you know, and, 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 and you know, even though other things are actually going on and, and the net effect of that is, is to, how do you get a person to vote against their own interests, right? <laughs> you, you convince them that they're voting for X, Y, and Z and, 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 and the people that they're actually voting for betray them and betray them and betray them. And I can show you, and I have commentaries to show you how each of the, for example, each of the last four presidents have absolutely betrayed the electorate that elected them. And this is ultimately what led to Trump, right? <laughs> you know, you know, and, 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 and why, why it's so sad that we don't understand why 70 million people voted for Trump in 2020, you know, more than in 2016. Right, that that we just want to put them under under the the rubric of misogynist and 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 put you know whatever you know, whatever whatever label you want to give, them. when when a lot of those people voted for Obama and a lot of those people would have voted for 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 Sanders right, but they voted for Trump because the last thing most of the American electorate wants to do is support either establishment party. I mean, there was a recent poll that said, and this first time in U.S. history, twenty three percent of Americans identify as Democrat. 21% identify as Republican. A huge plurality, you know, you know, majority of us, you know, identify as independent, right? But who are we giving them to who are we giving them to choose from? And 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 by the and candidly speaking, the Democratic Party is the absolutely most undemocratic of the two establishment parties, right? So, and I and, and let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. And again, this is besides left, right, and center. It's just what does the party, what is the what, what is the party doing? So in 2020, I mean 2016 was bad. It was bad. And we could talk about how the Clintons cut the deal to raise money for the super delegates. But in 2020, okay, for the first time in our democracy, one candidate either won or tied the first three elections. Bernie Sanders and Buttigieg tied Iowa, essentially in terms of number of delegates coming out of the Iowa caucus. Bernie won um, New Hampshire and crushed the field in, 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 in uh, Nevada. Okay, then you had two weeks for Super Tuesday. 
And the Democratic establishment was scared, scared. So they pulled out all the stops. Uh, no, no, put on your memory caps and tell me uh, for the audience, the last time you heard something like this happen. In that two week period, Pete Buttigieg, who, who, who was right behind Bernie, and Elizabeth Warren, who was right behind Bernie, um, Buttigieg, who were legitimate candidates for the nomination, drop out of the election and throw their support to Biden, who's like number five. <laughs> Biden, you know, right? Okay. If you want to talk about banana republic, the fix is in in naked public site. There it is, <laughs> right? Oh, there is no way anyone who would who would announce for the presidency and build their career to get to that point. And they are actually competitive, right? <laughs> right. We're only three contests in. We drop out to throw their support to someone behind them. <laughs> just stop. That just okay. But that's what they did to get Biden, right? Okay, and, and what, all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is, is the American electorate is trying to get non-establishment people to lead, right? And and the Democratic Party is hell bent on preventing that. And look what they're doing now: no debates. It don't matter that Robert Kennedy Jr. is 19 percent, and and, and Marion Williamson is you know your eight to 10 percent, and stuff like that. Totally legitimate. They have the kind of support. That that the governor of Florida has in the Republican side, you know, you know, and yet we can't even get on the stage. But it's just like ridiculous to even talk. No, that is what the establishment is doing to try to stop our electorate, our people, from having their point of view heard. And so, but see, the, what they they're forgetting the lesson of our forefathers. I mean, if you prevent the peaceful means of exercising power, you create January sixth. You're giving, you're radicalizing folks because you're destroying their faith in the democratic process, right? So I don't know where the end game in the Democratic Party is, but the bottom line is we are empowered to take it back. But it starts by dismissing the narrative, start checking the facts, don't trust any mainstream media, right? Because they're all in on the game, they're all making the money, they're all getting paid by the same sources, you know. We need to reclaim our sovereignty. Kevin, are you interested in getting involved in in politics at any level? No, no, no. See, okay, there's everyone has uh, their lane in terms of what they can do for effectiveness. You know, mm -hmm. my lane, yeah. my lane for effectiveness, my particular skill is I I, I happen to be the person who who just because I'm as an analyst, I tend to connect dots from different areas. And, and I see a trend that makes sense. In this context, I see as my highest purpose, given the, t the kernel of information to, to our fellow Americans, right? To say, okay, here, here is the glitch in the narrative so that you can do what comes natural. Start asking questions, start penetrating, start, you know, say, and, and you start seeing, and then, you know, because part of that, if I can do that, this is what changes this country. I mean, when Thomas Jefferson said, you know, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. No country in the world felt that way. No country, that was not, you know, it, it wasn't onto a critical mass. I'm trying to be that seed to people to say, if you could simply get back in touch with who you are, if you could get back in touch with what works in your life, and not what everyone has told you and not these, you know, these manipulative influences on the outside, you will discover one, that you're powerful, that you can make a difference, that you can transform your life, that you could find fulfillment and, 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 and that you, we can build a society that we thought we were all gonna be a part of until we woke up into this American nightmare. You know? So that's best yeah, use of my time. I wonder I wonder what the best way to amplify a voice like yours might be. I mean, you see that the the establishment, I mean, they just shut down Tucker, right? So yeah, there goes yeah. a voice that starts to speak out and think a little bit differently and look back on past decision making and understand where influence came from and stuff like that. Um, one of our past podcast guests, Patrick Bet David, just uh, offered Tucker a hundred million over the next five years to join his team at Valuetainment. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, what what do you think the next step is for amplifying a voice like yours? I mean, obviously, 
the more people that you reach, the bigger of an impact you'll have. You'll help people wake up to some of these yeah. types of things with your commentaries. Well, I, oh, first and foremost, I think it's a good thing for Tucker because exactly right. You, where is the trend? Those who have the courage to speak truth to power, notwithstanding what, agreeing with what everyone says, are moving independent. You know, a listener sponsored, you know, um, a media and stuff like that. And the, the traditional model is crumbling. Look, look what happened to Fox's ratings since they, they they showed Tuck in the door. I mean, that's okay. So it, it's a good thing. He's fine. His voice is not going to be silenced. Again, the electorate wants this. The people want this. So wherever he goes, he'll be like Rogan. You know, here's the hundred million dollars. You know, and, you know, and 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 he will be above them now. He will be, you know, independent of them. They will not be able to. And and I look forward to hearing what he has to say. But as for Kevin Howard, so I am. There are a two other authors who were recently published. Um, who and yeah, gosh, I didn't get yeah. You know, I want to get the names right. De Deborah Deborah Kitchen, uh, she's a PhD out of Tennessee, and Eric Ober Oberin is a former prosecutor out of Baltimore. And both of them are amazing people. Both of them just recently published books. Um, Deborah is uh, she has her PhD in criminal justice and she teaches at one of the major Tennessee universities. And so she wrote a book on problems in America, a book, poetry, prose, um, from a criminal justice perspective. And Eric wrote a book on problems in his perspective was that our expectations of the legal system to provide justice are misplaced. The, the legal system actually just executes the laws. So our target to improve the legal system is to improve our laws. And so he's written uh, you know, the problems with the, legal, with the legal system from the legal system's perspective. And so we each represent a different take on what's a problem in America that we can fix. I'm talking to the individual about individual empowerment and, and reclaiming sovereignty, you know, and each of them are talking about different aspects of the system, institutions that make America, America. And so we're, we're planning to do a national college discussion tour and, and we're working on it. And, and it's, and, and the tour is called what the hell is wrong with America, you know, and we want to do it leading into the, the the national presidential elections next year because you know starting in january you're going to have all the primaries and all that stuff so it's that's going to be the whole thing next year so in october we're planning the first the the, the first um event and and we want to do it in tennessee home of where you know this awful event occurred the first it was a mass murder and then the kids protested and the tennessee legislator ex legislature expelled the two uh, black legislators now who've been reinstated. Okay, we're going to do it at one of the major Tennessee universities because Deborah is already established. She's a college professor and stuff like that. So and and get one or both of those legislators to attend to bring some visibility. And 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 the point of these events, you know, we we will read excerpts from our books. We're engaged in a conversation of how of, of like we're discussing here, and then we will engage the audience. And we're hoping to catch fire in terms of catch the attention of the nation when they're looking in, in the direction of who should be our next president and to say, okay, but let's do it in a context where we were reclaiming our power in a context where they can't buy it, <laughs> you know, you know, uh, by, by challenging the narrative, you know, holding, you're holding truth to power. And maybe we can actually inspire a third party. Maybe we could actually inspire, you know, like I said, I mean, I big supporter, I mean, left, right, center, you know, we need independent voices who are not simply serving wealth. And the things I have nothing against wealth. I have nothing against wealth, but let's be clear. Uber wealth has waged war on everyone else. And, and, and the impact of that is the boomer generation is the last generation where they did better than their parents. Generation X did not do better than the boomers. The millennials did not do better than X, and I'm an X, right? And, and Gen, Gen Z, is not, is not even going to do better than than the millennials, right? I mean, everyone. I mean, broadly speaking, there's always exceptions. But my point is, how'd that happen, right? And 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 so we really, really, really need to talk, have this conversation, and then maybe we can get a president who can actually make a difference. Because as far as I'm concerned, it, it ain't Biden. And and if the choice <laughs> is Trump, I mean, oh my god, 
shoot me. No, I mean, and, and, and again, I understand why people vote for him. But the con but but the, the sad thing about the the sad thing about the manufacturer of consent is he's not going to solve the problem that people are voting for. He is the establishment. He's the billionaire establishment. He owns the politicians. He's the okay. So but so so when when um do you know um oh the comedian oh uh but he's uh, I'll think of his name but he, he does a skit about you know the Trump voters you know um Pharrell Farrell no um well if I I think of it if it comes to me but yeah I'm hope we hoping to use the tour to start the conversation that maybe we can get a third party thing going. Well, if you make it up in the Boston area, I'm there. That's for sure. Are you kidding? We are definitely coming up. I mean, you talk about a wonderful place. I mean, I love Boston. I'm originally from New York. You know, so, hey, forgive me. You know, but I love Boston. <laughs> you, went, you, went, you know, you, I mean, you have so many great universities. So we will, if we, our thought process, we start in Tennessee because of, uh, um, um, Devers um, influence there, and and it happened to be a hotbed. We'll go to we'll go to uh, Baltimore, where Eric comes from, you know, and, and maybe the University of Maryland is somewhere in that area where he's where he was a prosecutor. Then we'll go out west, but eventually we will swing back. <laughs> of course, we got to go to Boston. You know, I we love it. Tour without it. <laughs> I um I just I have a few more minutes, so Luke, you can cut this part out. But Luke, I feel like I hogged most of the questions here so i want to give you a chance to ask a few before we wrap up and oh it's, man it's all good there's so much to unpack i feel like and um just so many questions so many things i want to ask about like what what can gen x do I and mean, what can the yeah gen x do what can the what can the boomers do what can gen z do like all the all these different generations how can we all like come together work together to to fix all these these problems like you called you said the the American nightmare, because I feel like that is that's where we are, and we need to to start to change these things. So I guess maybe that's what we can wrap it up with, because um, I know you need to go, Nick. But uh, maybe we can wrap it up with what is something that an individual can do today to start reclaiming their sovereignty and also to start helping change the establishment as it stands today. Great question, Luke, and I appreciate you asking it. And you know, it's going to sound trite because it's not, you know, it's 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 not like it's a secret, but it's something we're not doing. It's so important to silence the external noise and take a good sober look in the mirror and get to understand how that person thinks, how that person that you're looking at, what do you value, not what society expects you to value. You know, what about your ex your actual lived experience shows you what actually works and what doesn't, as opposed to what you to are told works and what doesn't? Because the more you get in touch with that person, the more you will realize what is true, the more you will realize how the external is so much lies and manipulation and that and how you can dispel it like that by recognizing, oh, okay, it's been the Truman Show. And now I see the I see the I see that the 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 sky is actually closed. <laughs> okay. And nothing will ever be the same. That will just start a journey of conversation, of question, of of you know, and one of those things, one of the and, and, and the starting point for that discovery, because I know that sounds very um theoretical, just focus in on how you survive each day. Get back in touch with that because we 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 literally have forgotten that we don't we've had that conversation we don't produce the food we eat we don't produce the clothes we wear we don't produce the car we drive in order for us to have a good day so many other people have to do what they do well and and when we have a bad day it's not just because we made a mistake it's because someone else made a mistake and it affected us when you start realizing that's who you are that you are a part of an interdependent symbiotic relationship with with the, with the broader society it will change your perspective on not only who you are, but who the stranger is. The sh it's not stranger danger. That person is, is, is doing something that's contributing to your well-being. And, and if you close yourself off from them, you're closing yourself off from a very important part of how you get by. And, and if you could just switch that filter from this independent filter, thinking about myself first, 
to thinking about us, it, it opens up a whole range of possibilities that you never considered based on the fact that you've been convinced that the only way you're going to get by is fend for yourself. Well, that's actually not how you live, <laughs> you know? So that's what I mean. Start in the mirror, get to know this person, get to know how you function each day, and then build your life based on that truth and judge everything else by that. I, I have such a hard time not jumping in. I need to use more restraint, like a triple unmute <laughs> button. But Kevin, I wanted to add that over the last yeah. couple of years, I've been fortunate enough to travel to about 20 different countries. And what you mm -hmm. realize all over this world is people generally want the same thing. They want to provide security to their families. They want to enjoy what they right. do. And that's about it. Nobody's out to get you. And uh, it, places like New York City, where there are so many people that it's simply an inconvenience to walk from A to B, like we need to adjust how we're living in certain places so that other people are not seen as an inconvenience and they're seen as, you know, part of a bigger whole like you're talking about. All right. I'll back. I'm back on mute. No, no, Nick. I think that's a great. I think that's a great point. But I will point out that even in, particularly when you travel abroad and you go to a place, you know, places like Mexico City, and there's lots of places with high population density. It is, and yet they still have much more harmony. They still perceive each other much more from a community sure. standpoint. You don't lose your independence, your individual characteristics because you recognize that you actually live symbiotically. You gain the benefit of understanding that, that you are part of something bigger, right? And, and it really does empower you to, to co-create a reality that's more in line with how you live. You know, we, most of us suffer from cognitive dissonance because society has convinced us to believe certain things that are in direct conflict with how we survive each day. Nothing in nature lives independently. And, and that's not a bad thing. It really is not a bad thing. You know, so that's my, my takeaway message to, to everyone. <laughs> yeah, well, Kevin, I, I love it. I appreciate your time so much. Um, I, man, I feel like we could just stay here for hours just listening to you talk. So I'm excited. I can't wait to hear more about you touring the country and starting in Tennessee because yeah, I'll, um, if you're close to me, wherever I'm at in October or whenever you start, like, I will um, be coming to listen for sure. Um, so well, with I, that, but yes. no, go. For no, no, no. Go ahead, Luke. No, no, please go ahead. No, no. I was just gonna. I was just going to um, just for us to wrap it up. I was just gonna say um, for people who are listening that want to learn more about your work, what you do, and uh, get more involved. Where can they go and what can they do? Well, they can they can um, get more information about my book Onward at Last from uh, www onward at last.com they could purchase the book which is in hardcover it's on uh, an audio book on itunes and it's uh, e, e, a kindle ebook um on barnesandnoble.com on amazon on you know because it, it is distributed through ingram so in anyone's online bookseller will have it you know so please do that including target i was surprised and 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 uh, powell books in, in in portland you know so please go and look for onward at last and take a look um if you can't afford the book and i totally get it it this is about the message if you go to my website and go to the to the blog page on my website all the commentaries are available for free the point is is for you to get the message that you matter, you are important, you are powerful, more powerful than these people would want you to know. And 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 so that's how you get in touch with me. And and leave comments, please. And you know, because I want to hear your thoughts. Um, because this is an interaction, interactive discussion. That always makes me um, you know, it gives me goosebumps when somebody sits there and they say, You matter, you have power, because it's so true. And I I try to tell people that all the time. So Thank you for spreading that message. Thank you for spreading your word. I tell you what, it is something that more people need to listen to and hear. So can't wait to share this and continue sharing your book with our community. And uh, yeah, can't wait to keep following along as well. Hey, thank you so much, guys. And once we get the once we get the tour going, maybe we could circle back around for another podcast interview. And we'll bring we we'll bring Deborah and we'll bring Eric on, and you know, and and it'll be a great another great conversation. But thank you so much for having me. Thank you.